highlight tonight, members of the Republican congressional baseball team returned to the field last night. It was the first time many of those members had been back since last year's shooting that wounded Congressman Steve Scalise and three others. This morning, the team took some time to reflect on that horrific day. Today is an emotional day. Last year, I was on this field walking. I was standing right behind home plate at that fateful moment when the gunman opened fire. It's probably one of the worst days of my life. The unfettered courage of the Capitol Police, they are the reason why we're all here today. Otherwise, it would have been like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, sometimes you think, you start wondering, is, is this a, really a bad dream? But coming back out here and seeing the evidence, realizing, you know, this was real. It is important, I think, to show continuity, to show that our team is not intimidated. We could start over. Baseball's great. Play ball, and may God bless all of you. Great stuff. Play ball. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That is it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and unafraid. We will see you tomorrow for my interview live here on set with former FBI Director James Comey. Believe it or not, there's a lot to ask him. He has a book out, you know. The story hosted by Martha McCallum starts right now. Martha, I'm going to ask you for questions. <laughs> I've got some. We're looking forward to that tomorrow night, Brett. Thanks a lot. See you. All right. So breaking tonight on the story, the man who cracked the case of the Golden State Killer today, making an arrest after searching for that man for more than 40 years. His unbelievable story is live here moments away. But first... 292 nominees are waiting for Senate confirmation, and now the logjam may be starting to break. Good evening, everybody. I'm Martha McCallum, and the story is that we expect Mike Pompeo to get his vote for Secretary of State tomorrow. The White House wants him on a plane to Brussels on Friday for the NATO meeting, so they are nudging forward on him uh, and his situation for Secretary of State. Two men that helped make that happen are here tonight, one eagerly and one somewhat reluctantly. We've got Leader Mitch McConnell, and then we will also speak to Senator Chris Coons, who brought tears to Bob Corker's eyes when he agreed to give Pompeo a thumbs up to get him through the committee. But first, Chief National Correspondent Ed Henry, live at the White House with the breaking news from there and the latest on Dr. Ronnie Jackson. Hi, Ed. Yeah, good to see you, Martha. Remember, President Trump gave Rear Admiral Ronnie Jackson an out yesterday, saying if it were him, he'd withdraw rather than take what the president called abuse from politicians about these allegations. Instead, uh, Ronnie Jackson decided to double down on his denials and now tonight is facing a mountain of new New allegations. Breaking this hour, Jackson trying to fight back, insisting it should be pretty easy to prove that he did not get drunk and then smash up a taxpayer funded vehicle as is now being charged. He said he's moving forward on the nomination. Senator John Tester, the top Democrat on the Vets Committee, just released a summary of conversations with 23 current and former colleagues of Jackson, many of them still in uniform, who charge misconduct, including allegations he repeatedly drank on duty and has an explosive temper. This new report charging while Jackson had to be on call if the president had a health issue, quote, on several occasions, Jackson would reach for the medical bag while intoxicated to show he was in charge. On at least one occasion, Dr. Jackson could not be reached when needed because he was passed out drunk in a hotel room. The report also alleging, quote, at a Secret Service going away party, Jackson got drunk and wrecked a government vehicle. Again, he's denying that, but it comes just hours after Press Secretary Sarah Sanders asserted there's no reason to believe the previous allegations that Jackson had been drinking on the job. She claimed the White House did a good job of vetting this nomination. Republican Jerry Moran, though, says the nominee told him he never had a drink on duty at all. And Moran was blunt today about saying he's not really sure what to believe as Democrats suggest this nomination could be dead. More broadly, then, do you feel like he was forthcoming with you in this meeting about these new issues? I don't know any, in, I don't have any sense that I was not told the truth until I have more information. They are serious, credible, profoundly significant. I see no realistic path forward for this appointment, and the administration has failed, abjectly and utterly failed to do proper vetting.
The White House has been in the middle of a full court press defending Jackson, citing glowing performance reviews by then President Barack Obama, like this one, October 2016, quote, Ronnie does a great job. Genuine enthusiasm, poised under pressure, incredible work ethic and follow through. Ronnie continues to inspire confidence with the care he provides to me, my family and my team, continue to promote ahead of his peers. Now, White House aides here are particularly upset that John Tester, the Democrat, top Democrat on the committee, came out and claimed that they're out allegations uh, that the doctor was known as the candy man for freely uh, dispensing prescription drugs. They note here that on long overseas trips, typically not just White House staffers, but journalists as well, in fact, will be offered uh, sleep aids, for example, to help deal with long overseas trips. They say, again, going back to the Obama administration, all this was reviewed and he got a clean bill of health. We'll see, Martha. We will. Uh, and thank you very much. So joining me now, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Leader McConnell, thank you very much. It's good Glad to have you with us uh, this evening. I, I want to start with, with Mike Pompeo. Do you believe that he will get a vote tomorrow and that he has the votes to pass in the Senate? He does, he does indeed. Uh, we'll be confirming him tomorrow. And there are now five Democrats who've come on board. There should, be a, should have been a lot more. Uh, this nomination really shouldn't have been... Um, so contentious, but nevertheless, we have the votes and he'll be confirmed tomorrow and be able to get started on representing our country abroad. And Rick Grinnell, the ambassador to Germany, is also going to be put through. Do you, do you believe he will pass? I certainly hope so. That's what we believe. Uh, we'll be voting on him tomorrow as well and look forward to confirming him because Chancellor Merkel is making a U.S. visit uh, shortly. Yeah. We'd like to have the ambassador to Germany in place uh, before then. How do you respond, Leader McConnell, to the criticism that there are still so many nominations that need to get through the Senate? When I uh, sent out a tweet earlier today that I was going to be speaking with you, um, a number of people said, please ask Senator McConnell why he is not scheduling more time to push through these nominees. He said he would work weekends, he would make people stay weekends, mm -hmm. and that that would break the logjam with Democrats and that this 30 hour rule would probably go out the window pretty quickly. Well, a number of times when we've uh, threatened to do that, they, they have collapsed. Uh, we've actually gotten a lot of nominations this year, but the president has a very legitimate complaint. I've had to file cloture. That's the device by mm -hmm. which you stop debate 88 times uh, in the Trump administration. That's more than the last six presidents in the first two years together. So the Democrats do have an opportunity to slow the process. Uh, we're working hard to try to truncate that. Uh, for example, we're having the two votes tomorrow because they've decided not to use all of the time uh, they could have used. Uh, we're continuing to put the pressure on. It's a legitimate complaint. It, you know, so in terms of the August recess and the circuit court judges that are still out there, because there are some uh, who are concerned, they're concerned about whether or not the Republicans can hold the House. And now there's some increasing concerns potentially about the Senate. And I want to ask you about that in a moment. Um, but they think that you really need to put the pressure on these circuit court judges and to hold that August res recess over the senators heads to get that done. Will you commit to doing that? Well, look, the circuit judges have been my top priority. We can we confirmed 12 last year which is a record for the first term of any president going back to 1891. How many are still outstanding right now? Well, there's five more that are, going to, that are on the calendar, which means they're out on the floor. We'll yeah. be taking those up shortly. Uh, I've processed uh, circuit judges as rapidly as they've come out of committee. It's been my top mm -hmm. priority. So we're not behind on circuit judges. We're way ahead. The Democrats are complaining. But you would because use, we have confirmed what well, they're complaining because we confirmed so many circuit judges. I, I got you. But you, you, you wouldn't hesitate to use uh, to make people work over the weekend or to potentially over the August recess if you don't get the progress that you see. Yeah, of course Is that not. True? We're, we're going to confirm these judges. I don't care what. Uh, tactics they employ okay. and we're going to confirm the other uh, nominees the president has they've been completely unreasonable delays and we're going to grind through it and we're going to get them all do you support ronnie jackson for at the va that's a decision the president has to make i mean he has to decide uh, obviously whether to go forward with this nomination uh, the chairman of the uh, veterans committee senator isaacson postponed the hearing yeah. obviously there's a lot of discussion about whether this nominee should go forward I'm going to wait and see what the president wants to do. Okay. Uh, I want to talk to you about the Senate races um, because there's now increasing concern from uh, Steve Law, who you know well at American Crossroads, is saying that he believes that we do have a more defensive terrain to hold than when the cycle started. And targeted Democratic incumbents have been overperforming in terms of their early fundraising activity. There are those who would like to see a lot more 
urgency on the part of Republicans on Capitol Hill when it comes to these midterms. What do you say about that? Yeah, there's plenty of urgency, I can tell you that. I mean, the, the left is obviously fired up. Uh, they have uh, been doing great on fundraising. Uh, the left uh, turnout in places like the Virginia governor's race uh, was stunning. So there's no question, I would say, to all of our Republican uh, supporters across the country, we need to be turning out in big numbers this fall because the Democrats are fired up. Yeah. They, want, they want to take the Congress back. We think we have an excellent chance to hold it, but it does require a lot of enthusiasm. The Democrats are fired up. There's no question about it. But so are we, and we're going to be really fired up come November. Yeah. Uh, as you, you may have heard on the promo earlier, um, we're going to be in West Virginia uh, at the Senate primary debate, right. Brett Baer and I, on Tuesday night. Um, I, I want to play this for you. This is what one of the candidates, Don Blankenship, said uh, about your wife, Elaine Chow. Mm -hmm. I have an issue when the uh, father-in-law is, uh, you know, is a wealthy China person, and uh, there's a lot of connections to some of the brass, if you will, in China. Well, I don't have anything against his wife. I mean, I, I just saying that uh, it's her uh, father that is uh, well connected in China. What do you have to say about that, sir? Well, my father-in-law is a an American who lives in New York, works in New York, and uh, I don't have any a comment about ridiculous uh, uh, observations like that. You're, you and uh, Brett are going to be doing the debate. We'll look forward to seeing who the uh, Republicans in West Virginia choose to nominate. I hope it's somebody who can actually win the general election. Do you, who do you support there? I, I'm, I'm not in that race, uh, but I hope they nominate somebody who can actually win the general election. All right. Well, one last question. Uh, there's been a suggestion that you are reluctant to push through a second round of tax cuts to put the individual cuts uh, to make mm -hmm. them permanent. I, is mm -hmm. that something that you're hesitating to do? No, I'm, I'm all for making uh, all the tax cuts uh, permanent. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of red state Democrats could vote for that, and we still wouldn't get the outcome we want. But no, I'm very much in favor of making but, all the tax cuts. But you're not against permanent. people come a bipartisan vote in favor of tax cuts. Yeah, if we can win, we can get 60 votes and actually do it. I'm all for it. All right, Senator McConnell, thank you so much. Good to see you thank as always, you. sir. So here now, Democratic Delaware Senator Chris Coons, a member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Coons, thank you for being here uh, thank tonight. You, Mike. With regard to the Mike Pompeo nomination, I just want to play a moment from uh, Senator Corker, who was on with us last night. Here he is reacting to your decision to help get that through committee. Did you feel like it wasn't going to pass? And, uh, until Coons said, okay, I'll vote present? It sounded like there was you know, a lot of last minute wrangling. Um. Well, there was, but we were always going to vote him out. The question was, was he going to get a positive recommendation okay. or a negative recommendation? And we were able to work it in a manner which uh, it worked out very favorably. In fact, at one moment, he was, he was kind of choked up uh, by what you did, Senator Coons. Your thoughts? Uh, well, I was uh, grateful to have the chance on Monday uh, to make a small gesture of friendship and support uh, for Senator Johnny Isaacson of Georgia. Uh, I knew that Johnny had had an exceptionally difficult day. He delivered the eulogy uh, at his best friend's funeral. Uh, and we were in a place where we'd already taken the vote on foreign relations. Uh, every Republican voted in favor. Every Democrat voted against. Uh, and uh, Chairman Corker put to the committee the question, uh, are we really going to make Johnny come up here at 11 o'clock or later tonight uh, and reconvene just to cast exactly the same vote with exactly the same result? But, but, uh, but, or is there a Democrat who will, who will change their vote? So I changed my vote um, just to accommodate Senator understood. Isaacson. It didn't change the outcome. But, but that comedy does not go forward in terms of your, you're, you're going to vote against Mike Pompeo for Secretary of State tomorrow afternoon? I am. And, and Martha, if I could, I'd, I'd love a moment to explain uh, that part of what I was doing was paying it forward. Uh, Republican Senator Mike Rounds of South Dakota, uh, last year when my father died um, unexpectedly uh, and I was on the floor uh, looking and feeling miserable, he came across the floor and said to me, uh, if you need to leave and go be with your family, uh, I'll pair with you and work it out so that it doesn't change the outcome of the votes uh, so you can go be with your family. That meant the world to me. Uh, that really touched my heart, I and I everyone, think we need to do more things you know, like that. I, 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 here I with think each everybody other. listening would agree with you, um, yeah. Senator, for sure, uh, that gestures like that are meaningful um, between mm -hmm. friends and certainly on Capitol Hill as well. Um, but given the fact that there was such a you know nearly unanimous vote for John Kerry, for Condoleezza Rice, mm -hmm. for Rex Tillerson, got I think 64 votes. Um, why is this such a, a sort of statement that is being made against Mike Pompeo, who has worked with you all for years and who right. has a very good reputation. 
Uh, well, Martha, I'll, you know, in the debate on the Foreign Relations Committee, that same question was pressed. Uh, why aren't there uh, Republican nominees for this position that would get 70 or 80 votes? Uh, and I said to a number of colleagues that if Bob Corker were the nominee, I think he'd get 75 votes, uh, 80 votes. I think if it were Nikki Haley, uh, if it were Steve Hadley, uh, but these what are is your objection Republican to Mike senior Pompeo? leaders. I, I, and then I, I have to right. go. And what, the what, Democrats on the committee have uniformly said that things that he said and did as a congressman uh, and as a candidate in terms of uh, statements about uh, Muslim Americans, about the LGBT community, about how he conducted uh, portions of the Benghazi inquiry uh, left many of us uh, troubled about how he would I, be. I, I, I also that. was impressed with his military background uh, and how he has been a CIA director. Uh, I am hopeful that he will end up being a strong secretary of state and really serving the department and the country well. Uh, but I did not have a settled heart about it, and so I join many of my colleagues in voting against him, uh, I know uh, and we'll do so you've again on the floor. spoken in favor of the president's progress with the North Korea issue, and he feels yes. that Mike Pompeo is the person that he wants at his side in that. So we will see um, where it goes. Senator Coons, thank you very much. Good to see you thank tonight, you, sir. Thank you. Breaking news just in on President Trump's longtime lawyer, Michael Cohen, and the Stormy Daniels case. He is going to plead the fifth. Constitutional attorney Jonathan Turley on what that means. And 12 murders, 51 rapes, and now a former police officer, 72 years old, is in custody in one of the longest cold cases in U.S. history. The chilling details of his rampage, next. Joseph James D'Angelo has been called a lot of things by law enforcement. Today, it's our pleasure to call him defendant. Breaking news moments ago, Michael Cohen, President Trump's personal attorney, will plead the fifth in a California defamation suit that was brought by adult film star Stormy Daniels. In the filing, Cohen says that he is invoking his right against self-incrimination due to the ongoing criminal investigation against him by federal authorities, a probe that is setting off wild speculation about everything from Cohen flipping on Trump to presidential pardons. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Herridge, live in Washington with this late breaking news tonight. Hi, Catherine. Well, thanks, Martha. On this two-page declaration for a California court, the president's personal attorney, Michael Cohen, says he will take the fifth. California litigation, as you mentioned, is with Stormy Daniels and her attorney over a non-disclosure agreement, as well as the negotiation and payment of $130,000. Cohen cites the recent raid on his New York offices, his family apartment that's under renovation, as well as a hotel room. The declaration signed and submitted in New York City earlier today reads in part, based on the advice of counsel, I will assert my Fifth Amendment rights in connection with all proceedings in this case due to the ongoing criminal investigation by the FBI and U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York. And within the last few minutes, this tweet from Daniel's attorney, Michael Avenatti. This is a stunning development, he writes, never before in our nation's history has the attorney for the sitting president invoked the Fifth Amendment in connection with issues surrounding the president. It is especially stunning to see as MC, or Michael Cohen, served as the fixer for Mr. Trump for over 10 years. Cohen wants a civil suit filed by Daniels put on hold. The judge in that case wanted to hear from Cohen directly before making any decision, Martha. Catherine, thank you very much. You're welcome. Here now, Jonathan Turley, George Washington law professor and constitutional attorney. Jonathan, good evening. Always good to have you with us. And uh, <laughs> obviously, you wrote, you wrote a piece about Cohen and whether or not the president should pardon him. Uh, and now this breaking news. What do you think? Well, it is a rather low moment. Uh, you know, he, it, the taking of the Fifth Amendment uh, is something that most attorneys would not relish. You should be able to speak to your representation without uh, um, invoking your right to remain silent. And so it's, it's going to be a bad moment for him. It's going to be a bad moment for the, for the president. It's like being represented by Luca Brasi. You know, it's not a, uh, the optics are not good. Having said that, most attorneys would not want their client, who's the subject of a very significant criminal investigation, to be going into a deposition or any types of proceedings in a defamation case. What's interesting is that Mike Lavinati, who I should say is my former research assistant, um, has really uh, created quite a mess for uh, for Cohen, and in many ways, it's a it's a mess of Cohen's own creation. Uh, Cohen has really fallen into every trap that Avenetti has set for him, and it's proven to be his undoing. Uh, the problem, I think, for the president is that many of us said, now well, some of us said a year ago, that he should have severed his ties with Michael Cohen. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Cohen, to, to be as polite as possible, is rather reckless uh, as an attorney. Uh, he has hopelessly shattered, I think, the attorney-client privilege that would protect the president. That leaves only the Fifth Amendment as the last line of defense absent a, par a pardon. It, you know, in terms of, of the defamation case, and he says, you know, he's sort of protecting himself, you know, with, because he's also under investigation by federal authorities. Would you assume that he would do the same thing in that case? He might. I have to say the profile of that New York case looks very bad. I'm a criminal defense attorney, and it is a very bad situation. They're looking at him uh, for different types, uh, supposedly, of fraud. They've connected uh, some of the allegations to his uh, taxicab medallion business. These are the types of investigations that can easily trip wires into an indictment. Uh, he also had Do you think a lot any of them of trip wires with, as, with regard to the president? It could. The, 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 the danger that is Michael Cohen is that he did not maintain clear lines between being a lawyer, a fixer, a friend, a business associate, and that left the attorney-client privilege in tatters. So he destroyed, in my view, the greatest protection he could afford the president. And now, uh, sitting in some evidence vault, are all of his files, including possible recordings. It could not be worse. And so the question is confining the damage here for the president. All right. I want to ask you one question about the travel ban, because what we're hearing from the questions that were asked with regard to the president's travel ban in the Supreme Court is that the, the uh, members of the Supreme Court appeared to be somewhat hostile to the argument that the president had acted outside his power to protect the country. What are you reading into this in terms of how they may decide in this case? Well, I, I, I've stated all along that I believe the president had the law on his side uh, on this issue. Unless they're going to change major precedent, um, I believe uh, that he will prevail before the Supreme Court. Uh, the, what, what the lower courts did, in my view, is highly problematic. And some of them, I think, were unfair to President Trump. It, all of the use of his tweets in these cases was rather surprising and unprecedented. It's not that they have never cited uh, comments by, led, by politicians, but the amount of emphasis that they put on his tweets, I don't, I've never seen in another case, and I don't think the Supreme Court is going to follow their lead on they that. They don't seem particularly interested in them. Uh, all right, great. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Good to see you tonight. Thanks. Coming up. We found the needle in the haystack. And it was right here in Sacramento. What a day in this case. For more than 40 years, the ex-police officer, now believed to be the Golden State Killer, has been living peacefully in California. But last night, the police closed in. Detective Paul Holes has been tracking him for 24 years. And he's here with his story moments away. Plus, Kanye West apparently shed about 9 million followers today because he supports President Trump. And now his wife, Kim Kardashian, is trying to stop the bleeding. Candace Owens is no stranger to backlash for her beliefs. She joins me next. I think we deliver real, honest, strong opinion day after day, night after night on Fox. And the viewers expect that. They know with me they're going to get a straight shooter, no holds barred. I'm not going to cut people slack. But I'll also be fair. It's a place where we have real debate and we really respect the traditions that made this country great. Known as the Golden State Killer, the East Area Rapist, and the original Night Stalker, detectives eventually realized that it was all being done by one man. For 10 years in the 70s and 80s, he terrorized California, sneaking into women's homes, raping them at knife point, and murdering 12 people. And then for some reason, he stopped. And now Joseph James D'Angelo, former police officer, is behind bars. In moments, we're going to talk to Paul Holes, who worked this case nearly 25 years. But first, Trace Gallagher, live in our West Coast newsroom with the extraordinary backstory. Trace. 
Martha, what's astonishing is this investigation has been open and active for 42 years, and Joseph James D'Angelo was never a suspect until six days ago. But now we know the 72-year-old D'Angelo has lived in the Sacramento suburb for more than 30 years. And while the majority of these rapes and murders were committed, D'Angelo was a police officer in both Central and Northern California. In 1979, he was fired from law enforcement for shoplifting a hammer and a can of dog repellent and never contested his termination apparently to avoid a deeper investigation. In 1976, the suspect was initially dubbed the East Area Rapist after a series of sexual assaults in East Sacramento that all followed the same pattern, prying open a window, shining a flashlight in the victim's eyes, raping them, and in some cases later taunting them by calling them on the phone. Then in 1979, the same year, Joseph D'Angelo left law enforcement in Northern California. A string of rapes and murders began Began happening in Southern California. Police called that suspect the Night Stalker. In 2001, with advances in forensic technology, investigators found the DNA from crimes committed by the Night Stalker matched the DNA from the East Area Rapist. Then last week, police found their needle in a haystack. Watch. We did a lot of exclusions of other folks, we got this person that looked like he might be uh, our guy, and then uh, we're able to get at least an initial um, discarded DNA sample that gave us uh, more confidence that this was our person and we're able to continue and get a, a better, more workable sample of DNA. The sheriff wouldn't clarify exactly where the discarded DNA came from. Experts say it could be anything from trash to a piece of clothing. And there was no explanation for why, after 42 years, police finally narrowed the search to D'Angelo. The sheriff said only that they surveilled him and developed a plan to arrest him. A best-selling book about the Golden State Killer by the late crime writer Michelle McNamara renewed interest in the case, but it did not offer new evidence. For now, Joseph James D'Angelo is facing two counts of murder. Those charges are expected to quickly multiply. Martha. Incredible. Trace, thank you so much. Here now with more Paul Holes, newly retired Contra Costa County cold case investigator who worked on the Golden State Killer case for the last 24 years, 10 years of that exclusively on this case. Paul, tell me what this means to you, this apprehension. Uh, it's absolutely huge. After nearly a quarter of a century trying to find this guy, to actually see him after all these years of wondering who he was, it's an amazing moment, and I think it's an amazing moment for all the victims to finally know that this guy who's been out there all this time is in custody, he won't ever get out, and they can now feel safe. How did they find him in the end? In the end, it was leveraging new DNA technology and using uh, DNA technology that could produce leads that allows gumshoe investigation to follow up on and ultimately that led to a smaller pool of suspects and then he emerged as the number one priority. You know, did you know when you were looking at, at his profile, did you know that because he was so good at covering his tracks, did you suspect that he might be law enforcement? You know, there's there's been theories over the years that he could have had law enforcement and or military training. Uh, you know, from my assessment, I always saw him as a, a, a sophisticated and intelligent offender, but I didn't necessarily think that it meant that he had to be law enforcement. Now that we know he was law enforcement and then taking a look at the details in the case file, it adds up. Yeah. He had training. He understood law enforcement techniques. I know that you say that he would change his routine. So when there was an article in the newspaper that said he only attacks women who are alone, he read that. And then the next attack he did when a man was in the house, right? I mean, he constantly kept changing his game. Exactly. And, and, and in part, he was changing his game to try to you know, throw off law enforcement by making misleading statements or doing certain types of behaviors or actions that would make us think he's somebody different than what, who he was. Yeah. But he also was somebody that responded. And so that instance, if he reads an article in the newspaper that well, he only attacks when there's no man present, he's feeling challenged. Right. And so he took that challenge and, and, and upped the ante and attacked when a man was present. Yeah, the other thing that fascinates me is the, the dog repellent. He stole that. Do, was he using that to you know, fend off a dog when he was trying to get into a house? And, and could that have been a bigger clue back then? 
You know, we, we have no instance in which he knowingly used dog repellent. He most certainly could have, uh, you know, either ahead of time to try to uh, sensitize these dogs to who he was and fear him so they would not aggressively come after him when he attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, he had some uh, kind of an unusual, uncanny ability to uh, control the dogs in these mm -hmm. residents, whether they be in the, wow. the yard or inside the house. Um, two last things. When you Look at potentially the motive, why you think that he was doing this. And also, were you told anything about what his reaction was when the police closed in on him yesterday or last night? Uh, well, in terms of his reaction, he was uh, taken into custody very rapidly. Uh, he was stunned and he most certainly understood the gravity of, of being in custody. Mm -hmm. and, and I, I directly observed that. Mm -hmm. The, uh, the, the motive of why he was doing these crimes, these horrific crimes, it is unknown at this point in time. There's a lot we don't know about him right now, and there's a lot more investigation into him, his background, and where he was during the, the, the various attacks through yeah. Northern California down to Southern California. I mean, it's amazing. He, he called one of his victims 20-something years later on the phone. I mean, he obviously is a twisted individual, which is apparent from all of this, but congratulations to you, Paul, and everybody else who worked this case. This is a huge, uh, a huge finding here tonight, and we thank you very much for talking with us. Good to see you, sir. Keep thank us posted. You. Good to see you. All right, you too. Paul Holes, thanks for being here. So coming up, remember these socks that President George H.W. Bush wore at his wife Barbara's funeral? Wait till you hear the full backstory about the company that made them. But first, Kanye West called Donald Trump his brother today. It's got the media in a frenzy that even Sarah Huckabee Sanders has, was asked to address. Candace Owens on deck with her reaction. I know they met during uh, the transition. That's the only meeting I'm aware of that's taken place or conversation. <laughs> Before everybody has a meltdown. West shedding some followers on Twitter because of the love that he's showing for President Trump and for my next guest. This morning, he called President Trump his brother. You don't have to agree with Trump, he wrote, but the mob can't make me not love him. We are both dragon energy. He is my brother. I love everyone. I don't agree with everything anyone does. That's what makes us individuals. And we have the right to independent thought, to which President Trump replied, thank you, Kanye. Very cool. It seems Kanye is okay with two terms for the president, but he also tweeted a look into the future at his own run with this cryptic 2024. And it seems that it all started after the pushback Kanye got for writing, I love the way Candace Owens thinks. Here now is Candace Owens, Communications Director of Turning Point USA. Candace, good to see you uh, tonight. Thank you Thank very you much for, having for me. being with us this evening. Um, I want to put up a tweet that, that you wrote. You said the masters control everything, including who blacks and even are allowed to like, are even allowed to like. Kanye tweeted seven words, seven words, and they jumped up and told blacks that they must immediately revolt. How many of you jumped up and did that? How many of you have your minds enslaved? Tell me about writing that. It's just the truth. It's what I've been preaching about long before Kanye wrote this seven word tweet that broke the internet is that they, at once they enslaved our bodies, the Democratic Party, but today they have enslaved our minds. They have told us who we must love, who we must hate, what we must think, what ideas are unacceptable. And in the long run, they just it just doesn't add up. Listen, I think differently. Kanye West thinks differently. I can guarantee you if he and I get in the same room, we will have a lot of disagreements. The one thing that we will celebrate is our right to think differently. I don't understand what's so controversial for the left to understand this. The way that they have demonized him in the last 72 hours is almost sickening, but at the end of the day, it's going to have adverse effects. I can guarantee you that. Well, Kim Kardashian seems a bit concerned about it. Um, she tweeted uh, to the media trying to demonize my husband. Let me say this, your commentary on Kanye being erratic and his tweets being disturbing is actually scary. So quick to label him as having mental health issues just by being himself. He's always been expressive. It's not fair. I, I wanna take a look at John Legend too, because he is very upset. I love that great, brilliant artists have the power to imagine a better future, but artists can't be blind to the truth. Candace. 
Well, first of all, John Legend has me blocked on Twitter. He and his wife made some very vicious attacks against me before Kanye ever got involved. They said some nasty things to me uh, because I support President Trump. That's the only reason. At the end of the day, I think that there, this is sort of foot in your mouth syndrome with John Legend and his wife, Chrissy Teigen. They've been disgusting. They have led the pack in hate against President Trump in so much that President Trump blocked his wife because she basically said, if you don't agree with me, I have the right to bully you. These are the celebs that say that they preach love. They don't preach love. What Kanye West is preaching right now is love. And Kim Kardashian is going to stand beside her husband and the father of her children. And I'm proud, very proud to say that I stand with both of them. So when you look at how the African-American community has been treated by President Trump versus President Obama, you know, in terms of support, in terms of economic encouragement, in terms of empowerment, who, who do you think did a better job, has done a better job? I think President Barack Obama did a better job at creating a facade. That's exactly what it was. It was a facade. It was a mirage. And we were all dying in a desert is what really happened, okay? He had tons of hip-hop artists. He had Jay-Z and Beyonce there all the time. But at the end of the day, what was going on in Chicago? Nothing got better in the black community. In fact, things got worse for the black community. He stepped out of the office and the country had never been more divided. I never felt this way about blacks and whites when I was growing up in school. But I feel this way now because that's what Barack Obama effectively worked on. It was a way to enslave us to the Democratic Party. You know, do you think he wasted an opportunity, President Obama? No, I, I think that he never really had power at the end of the day. He never really had any power because he borrowed a lot of money to get into office. And at the end of the day, if you borrow money, they are the people that control your strings. On the other hand, we have President Donald Trump, and he's completely free because he walked in there as a billionaire, and they tried to demonize that. He became a billionaire because of capitalism and free markets, things that we should be celebrating in this, in this country. That is what America is all about, the American dream, and anybody can do that. I'm so happy, again, to see that Kanye West is giving the American dream black back to black America. All right, Candace, thank you very much. Very interesting to talk with you. Uh, and I'm glad you're here tonight. We hope to see you again soon. Many thanks. Thank you so much for having me. You bet. Anytime. So coming up at Barbara Bush's funeral, her loving husband, Bush 41, as he's affectionately known, wore these socks as a tribute to her devotion to fostering literacy in America. But there is more to this story. John and Mark Cronin are the men behind those socks. And they have the support of Bush 41. They're here next. Well, I, I like a colorful sock. I'm a sock man. This is a modest pair here today. Subdued, you might say. with a great story tonight and we are also happy to report at the top of this that President George H.W. Bush has been moved out of intensive care. He is now in a regular recovery room where he is, according to his spokesman Jim McGrath, joking with folks at the hospital and saying that he's more concerned about the upcoming Rockets playoff game than anything that's going on with him or his health. According to his son Jeb, he says dad is stronger than an ox and he plans to return home by Friday. We also know know that he wants to get to Maine uh, this summer, and we certainly hope that he is able to do that as well. But all of that brings us to this great story behind the colorful socks covered with books that everyone noticed at Barbara Bush's funeral because he wore them as an homage, a tribute to the First Lady's passion for fostering literacy. And a gift to him from my next guest, who is now selling hundreds of those socks and all the proceeds are going to the Barbara Bush Literacy Foundation. Here now is 22-year-old John Cronin, Chief Happiness Officer of the very special business called John's Crazy Socks, which he co-founded with his father, Mark, who also joins me. Mark and John, good to see both of you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so, so much, So tell Mother. me the story, John, about how you, how did you make this connection with your business and President Bush 41? Um, I hear I, I started um, from last year. Um, uh, a we a recent I sent a sock to uh, uh, the George W. Bush. Cause you knew he liked crazy socks. I he, and so do you. I he liked wearing my crazy socks. <laughs> and then um, and then uh, back then, and now um, well, uh, in the beginning of March, uh, be, right. his office called yeah. and asked for some more socks. So you sent him some more socks, right? I did. And what did he send you? 
He sent me a a a, a sock all day. Uh, oh, oh, you have so. I, I, you have so. And he gave me, he gave me back uh, the letter, a very touching. Oh, you, how did it feel to get a letter from the former president of the United States? Oh, uh, I, 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 I feel so happy. I'm so inspired. I, I see a really good guy. Um, yeah. I, I, he, uh, amazing. He's a really great guy, and yeah. he's amazing, and you're a, you're a great guy, and you're amazing. So it's no surprise Thank to you. me that you get along so well. And you gave him, you created the, the Down Syndrome Superhero Sock. All right, I'm going to try and point out uh, yeah. uh, those socks are superhero socks. Um, um, some those socks are, I chose, uh, I tell you about those socks. Those are awesome. Uh, uh, I chose the picture. You drew the picture. Uh, 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 I chose the so hello, um, I, 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 who is it on it? It's me. <laughs> <laughs> it looks exactly I, like you. I, I definitely I, it's like obvious. me. I, 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 I definitely look like hello. And then, <laughs> and President Bush right. wore these on Down, World Down Syndrome Day. Oh, that's wonderful. And he sent a, out a, a tweet. And pl plus, he, uh, he tweeted uh, up, he tweeted on, on the World Down Syndrome Day. Yeah. And uh, he tweeted and say, I'm amazing. I, I'm wearing your so sock. Fine. You're very accomplished. You were in the Special Olympics and you started this business with your dad. And we know that President Bush 41 right. uh, did the American Disabilities Act. He's very interested in the kind of business that you're running. And Mark, I know that you try to employ people with differing abilities. And how many employees do you have? Well, part um, of our mission is to demonstrate what's possible. We can do that every day. One way is by creating jobs, and we've created 33 jobs, 15 of those are held by people with differing abilities. And the key, it's not altruism, it's good business. These people are terrific, and we succeed because of the work they do. And John, you're the boss? I'm, I'm kind of a boss, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm going to ahead my, myself. <laughs> so what is your message? Are, are, you must be happy, as I think everybody is, that, that uh, President Bush seems to be recovering in the hospital. Do you want to send him a message? Um, so. What would you we say? We want him to get better, right? I want Get I, better, President I just Bush. Want, I just want to get better. And um, I hope you are uh, okay. And thank you um, as I'm saying the soft. And you've and, been so supportive, and we thank you too. Um, and we we know that he probably would love another another pair of socks. John right. and Mark, thank you so much. Good to see you both. We gotta tell people quickly. Oh, go where can they get great socks? I, I, I get get the best great sock ever, and Sean great socks. All right, we're gonna we got it right on the bottom. Thank you so much, Sean. Good to see you, Mark. Thanks thank for coming. You. We'll be right back.